ones, certain concepts are important to understand. It is important to understand that there is nothing me and you can do that will harm the majesty of Allah Rabbul Izzah or that would benefit the majesty of Allah Rabbul Izzah. I deliberately start blunt because it is important for us to have a shift in paradigm to recalibrate. The Hadith Qudsi says, Ya ibadi, my servants, Law anna awwalakum wa akhirakum wa insakum wa jinnakum, if your first and your last and your male and your female and your ins and your jinn were to all gather together and all of that from the first to the last and the male and the female and the ins and the jinn were to become the most righteous individuals ما زاد ذلك في ملكي شيئا سبحان الملك it would not increase in my dominion not it would not add to my kingdom anything ويا عبادي my servants لو أن أولكم وآخركم وإنسكم وجنكم كانوا على أشقى قلب رجل واحد منكم ما نقص ذلك من ملكي شيئا and if your first and your last and your male and your female and your ins and your jinn were to become the most obedient of hearts, the most wretched of souls, Allah Rabbul Izzah says it would not take from my dominion anything. That is Allah Jalla Subhana. That leads to a concept that you need to understand. The concept is that whatever Allah Rabbul Izzah decreed upon you, He decreed for your welfare because it doesn't do anything for Allah Rabbul Izzah. Do you understand? So what Allah Rabbul Izzah prohibited you from, He did it for your welfare because it will not add anything to the majesty of Allah Rabbul Izzah. So Allah sent a deen for you to help you achieve success in the akhirah, to help you achieve his rida, to help you live better lives, to help you see better, to help you function better, to help you think better, to help you feel better. The deen came for you. And of the things, so whatever Allah decrees, dear ones, important shift in paradigm. Don't ever think, oh, why do I have to do this? Rather think, what benefit has Allah put in this for me? So today, I want to address a specific component of the dictates of deen. And I will use the word emotional management. Allah Rabbul Izza sent the deen. Part of it was to teach us to manage our emotions. Can I give you a scenario? Visualize this with me. Imagine there's a room. In that room, just imagine there's some people. Imagine it's home, there's a father, there's a mother, there's a son, there's a daughter, there's a wife, maybe there's some guests. They're sitting down in a room. Uh, have you got it? Can you see it? That doesn't sound very convincing, mashallah. Allah bless you, Ya Rab. Can you see it? I don't know. Can you see it? Allah protect you, Ya Rab. So, then imagine... They're sitting, and a mouse comes into the room. Now visualize the reactions. I'll help you. So there'll be a scream from someone, 
and they'll go up against the wall and ah, like that. There'll be one who'll jump on the table, hysterical. There'll be someone who'll take their shoes off and chase. There'll be a little kid who goes, oh, mouse. Have you noticed something? Same scenario, same stimulus, distinctly different responses. It shows one thing, that in life you can't always control the stimulus. You can't always control what happens. You always have control of what you do to your emotions. You with me? So you're not responsible to the level that you're not responsible for what happens outside of you. But what goes on inside, that's your responsibility. Don't give someone else the power to control your emotions. For example, he made me angry. Like, sweetheart, your emotions. How did you give that power to someone else? And why, when you're angry with him, have you empowered him more to make him able to make you angry? So, my scene, Emotional management is something that you can do and the Dean requires. And then off the spectrum of emotions, my focus today is on the emotion of gratitude. So the Dean requires its followers to be grateful for different reasons. First of all, if you read, if you look at the Muslim life, as soon as you wake up, what's the first thing you say? MashaAllah. Alhamdulillahi alladhi ahyana ba'da ma amatana wa ilayhi nushur. That's an utterance of gratitude. Praise be to the Lord who gave me life after having taken it from me last night and to him is my return. Like if you sit down, if you really understand the words, like it's, it's life changing. Like, Ya Rab, you have given me a second chance. I was dead and have come back to life. Like if you do it and feel it, do you know what that will do to you? Like you will walk around, you see movies where a person comes out of, of prison. Like it's done, it's like I, I've got another chance. Or there's death row, and just before the death, someone releases him. There's excitement to the level of tears, because I have another chance. So the utterance is, Ya Rab, you took, my, and you, you took my life last night and have returned it. So it should induce gratitude. Then you go to the bathroom, you finish, Alhamdulillah. You eat food, alhamdulillah. You drink water, alhamdulillah. You look at yourself in the mirror, alhamdulillah. Can you see that the deen is about gratitude? And Allah Rabbul Izza commands, Remember Remember me, I'll remember you, and be grateful, and don't be ungrateful. Command. And psychologists say that the best gratitude, the best emotion you can have is the emotion of gratitude. Like the best state you can be in is a state of gratitude. Now understand, dear ones, gratitude is a state. It's not a word. The words are supposed to get you to a state. Have you seen those people that you say, Habibi, how are you? You go, Alhamdulillah. 
you know, he's sad, he's alhamdulillah means things are not working well for me, but what can I do, alhamdulillah? What he's supposed to say is alhamdulillah. You know, I am alive, I am breathing, there's air, like uh, I have clothes, there's food, I have family, there's shelter. Um, Alhamdulillah, I'm still living, my account is still going, there's still khair I can do, there's still a future I can change. So gratitude, dear ones, is a requirement of deen. And listen to the verse Allah Rabbul Izza says, if you're, grat if you're grateful, لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ If you, I will increase it for you. Remember how I said the most productive emotion. Gra Allah says, I will increase it. And if you're ungrateful, إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيد My punishment will be severe. Now, why am I talking about gratitude in a conference about facing reality? Because dear ones, research, think tanks, all are pointing towards that life will start becoming more and more difficult. For example, in the West, think tanks are predicting that automation will start becoming more and more of a, of a reality. So the jobs that you used to do before, now machines will do. You know, some brothers drive Uber. So Uber, a company that take a certain percentage and they give you a certain amount of money and income. But Uber currently is actively pursuing driverless cars. Why? Because greed, they want the whole money themselves. Why should they pay you that, that percentage? So when it becomes driverless, automated, those people are out of work. In our country, in Australia, we have full truck lines without any drivers. They go miles on end, come back miles on end, no driver. We used to have rubbish collection that people used to come pick the bin up, machine comes, grabs it, empties it, goes. And there's little sensors in the bin that tells the company that the bin is full, come and empty it. No one has to go around and look to see if the bins have become full. Surgeries are now being done by machines. Legal advice, as in law, now that, you know, given by computers. So they predict as automation starts kicking in, jobs will reduce from five days full time to four days. And then in the West, it will come down to three days a week, full time. That's, that's a job. Are you able to visualize the problems associated with this? Because for a century, we've been telling people, study, graduate, go to university, you'll get a job. So the whole population, legally obliged, at least in our country, yours might be similar, to study, stay in school till the 17th year of their lives. Why? So that you can be educated, go to university, get a job. Like, sweetheart, what are you going to do with them now? Like, you've got no job to give them, the machines are doing the work. So what will you do? And what will happen to an endless population who don't have work, don't have something to actualize their dreams with? Do you see the amount of psychological stress? Don't belittle this, this is coming. Like the interviews of the richest men on the planet talking about um, some kind of international wage for people to get paid for doing nothing. Like, Getting paid is one part, but what will they do with life is another component. So stresses will increase, mental health issues will increase, and that is why now they're pumping through the curriculum to teach people how to become more resilient and to how to cope emotionally, because they can see it's coming. 
and they can't, they, at this stage, there's no will to stop it, so learn to cope with it. So for that, emotional management is important because we are facing reality, dear ones. And of the emotional management, gratitude. Now I want you to look at this scenario with me. If you, are, if you grow the capacity to be grateful individuals, or actually leave that, just let's watch this scenario. Two people. Two people, one's a millionaire. No, let's do another one. Two people, both have the same amount. So imagine they both have nothing. They both have nothing. This one poor, this one poor. But this one's grateful and this one's not. So you go to this one, Habibi, how are things? Oh, Alhamdulillah. What a day. This guy passed here today and gave me a penny. You know, he's such a nice guy, such a wonderful person. Weather's really nice and he's homeless. And the other person, same situation. And, oh, can't you see? What do you mean, how was life? You know, death is better than this. What am I? Both same scenario, same situation, yet one has gratitude, so his body feels like he has everything. The psychology feels like he has everything. This other one doesn't have anything, and yet the psychology self-harms as well. So now every cell from his toe to his head is miserable, down, doesn't want to live, will come uh, into sickness, doesn't want to get up, doesn't want to move. Um, same scenario. Let's change the scenario. A millionaire and a millionaire. Millionaire and a millionaire. So you go to this one, Habibi, how was life? Oh, Alhamdulillah. You know, Stas, what else? What, what can I ask for? You know, I have clothing. Allah has blessed me with a house. Look at that. I, you know, family. Ni'mah, uh, ni'mah. What are you talking about? Ni'mah. I live in bliss. And you tell the other one, Habibi, how was life? Oh, it's hard, you know, hard work. A, a lot of hard work. You know, have you seen Elon Musk, how much money he has? And I'm living with, you know, khair, alhamdulillah, you know, alhamdulillah. Do you see he has a million but has nothing? Has a million but still empty. Has a million still mis miserable. Let's do another scenario. <clears throat> there's a millionaire and there's an average working class person surviving. The average class, grateful. The millionaire, ungrateful. So you go to this one, Habibi, how was life? Oh, what a joy, Ustaz. What a lot, what do you, bliss, every moment, have you seen what's happening in, Ye in Yemen and in other countries? People, we are in joy, we, we are in the blessings of Allah, Allah is kind, Ustaz, Allah is kind, Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbi, Alhamdulillah, and every cell in his body is dancing with joy. Then you go to this millionaire, Habibi, how was life? What do you mean, how was life? You see that Royal Royce, do you know how much that costs to run? I don't even know why I bought it. What a musibah. And look, oh. Do you see? He has everything and has nothing. Has nothing and has everything. Dear ones, you're responsible for your emotions. Learn to practice gratitude and learn to teach gratitude. And with, when you're grateful, Allah will bless it. And when you're ungrateful, Allah will take it. I'll repeat. When you're grateful, Allah will bless it. When you're ungrateful, Allah will take it. I will, I will prove it to you. Bidalil. Bidalil. So in the Sahih Bukhari, there's a story that the Sahabi Ibn Abbas or it might be Ibn Mas'ud, I might forget, narrate about Ibrahim alayhi salam and his son Ismail. 
So Ibrahim alayhi salam used to live in Bilad al-Sham, a muhajir most of his life, and Ismail was where? Where was Ismail, dear ones? Wonderful Muslims of the UK, where was Ismail? I'll count to three, then everyone answered together. Where was Ismail? One, two, Mecca. So Ibrahim alayhi salam came to Mecca to the house of Ismail or the tent of Ismail. And Ismail is not there. So his wife came and sees elderly man, because remember, Ibrahim alayhi salam had Ismail at ripe old age. Elderly man, the Khalil of Allah, you can see, I'm deducing you, you would see light on, on the Khalil of Allah's face. You know. So she asks him, in and he sits and asks her, uh, where is Ismail? So she says, he's gone out hunting. So hunting those days, not like shopping center where you walk out to get meat. You know, you, you go, you chase the game, you try to find something, survive, bring it home. Um, as a practice, go get the sheep from a farm, put it on your shoulder, walk a little bit, see how difficult it is. You know, full-time job hunting. So Ismail's gone hunting. <clears throat> um, so then he asks, how are things? How is life? And then she starts. Food is very little, weather is hot, listen, and on and on she went, and the man listened. And then he tells her that when Ismail comes, give him my salam. And tell him, change your doorstep. So Ismail came, Prophet of Allah. So he says, Did anyone come? Has anything happened? So she says, yes, this elderly man can. Uh, what did he say? Oh, he um, asked where you were. I said, you went hunting. Anything else? Yeah, asked about our livelihood. And um, I told him, I told him. Uh, and then did he say anything? Yes, he told me to tell you to change your doorstep. So he said, that is my father, the Khalil of Allah. And you're my doorstep. He's asked me to change you. So you're divorced. When I talk about this, people just see a story. Time passed. Ibrahim alayhi salam came back. And when I say time passed, as in time passed, because he was in another place, Ibrahim, yeah? came again to the dwelling of Ismail, asked permission, where is Ismail gone? Hunting. How, how is your life, my, my daughter? Alhamdulillah, we have, we have meat and we have water. So he said, Allah bless your meat and Allah bless your water. Tell him my salam when he comes back and tell him keep your doorstep. From this progeny, from this progeny, the Rasul of Allah comes. Now I want you to, to, to understand a few things, dear ones. First point, on record, on the ahadith, Ibrahim has come all the way from Jerusalem to here. He hasn't done anything else. This is the only thing he did on record. Because he could have waited. Do you understand? And Ibrahim is under the command of Allah. And prophets don't do things ad hoc. They don't even speak of their own desires. So 
Allah Rabbul Izzah has sent him here to go look at this situation and this is his input. So first lesson, dear ones, this will, first lesson, unconventional lesson, the soldiers of Allah are many, the workers of Allah are many, prophets, birds, creation, men, jinn, ins, the master of everything is Allah Rabbul Izza. Sometimes Allah Rabbul Izza sends from his junood someone into your life to pull something out of your life. You with me? Because he came and this is his only instruction. So when some... Sometimes when some people and some things leave your life, have the wisdom to understand that the master of creation wanted this and secretly in your heart say Alhamdulillah. Because maybe from this relationship, this union, this gathering, a prophet wasn't destined to come, so you have to change so that a prophet could come. For me and you, there's no prophet we anticipate, but each one will be heading to a different journey and inshallah to your own level of greatness. Maybe that person isn't supposed to go with you and doesn't have clearance to go with you and doesn't have permission to go with you. So Allah Rabbul Izzah cuts that anchor off so that you could keep going. So say Alhamdulillah. Second, notice what her ingratitude cost her. And this is equally correct for men or women. It's just coincidental that in this situation, the story is, a, is about a female. Her ingratitude, her ungratefulness cost her marriage to a prophet. Like, dear ones, in the scale of greatness, you will not marry better than a prophet. Like, like how do you compare the light of a candle with the blazing sun? You know, prophets are God. By verses, the best of creation. Like this is not your girlfriend saying, no honey, he's no good. Allah is saying he's good. So the best man, and she lost him because of his ingratitude. Remember when I told you, if you're grateful, Allah will increase it. If you're ungrateful, Allah will take it. So Allah took it.